we, this, that theme that you just talked about, about millennials not having any money, has come up a couple times. And it seems like you know, that's one of the threads that kind of ties everything together politically and socially right now, right? Where if you go back to like the late 60s again, people, you know, middle aged people were looking at the colleges, looking at the youth movement, and they were like, oh my God, like when these people take over our society, like actually go out and get into authority positions. Like we're just, I guess we're just done. This is the end of America, the end of the world. And of course it turned out not to be that way uh, because those people got out of college and they got jobs and bought houses and had kids. And then once you get to that point, you kind of care about what your community is going to be like in 10 years. You care about what kind of schools your kids are going to. And you be, that's another way of saying you basically become a conservative in a lot of important like dispositional ways. You look at the millennial generation, and so what happens, right? So every every like 25 years or so is like when that happens in the past. You get to about 25, maybe late 20s. By that point, your parents are starting to be like, are you not going to get married yet? Like what's going on? There was that, that was the timing of it. The millennials has had like that, that period, that young person period has had so much more room to run because they're in their mid to late 30s and they're not able to get married and have kids and buy houses or create a stable career. I don't think that's it. I don't, I, you know, I've heard a lot from millennials where they're like, we'd be getting married and having kids if it wasn't for this economy. And I'm like, I don't believe it. I just, I just think that's an excuse. I think people are just permanent children. Well, the, the economy is in a horrific state. When Obama bailed out no, Fred, I, Freddie Mae and Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie I'm, Mac, and I'm when gonna, we all found out we were on fiat <clears throat> currency and not the gold standard in 2007, everybody got the red pill. Uh, that was like, oh, and now we're, what are we just, are we in hyperinflation right now? I don't know if you'd call it hyperinflation, but we've just almost doubled our money supply. It's, it is, it's, it's, I'm gonna, I'll call myself out outright. I'm 36. I am not married. I'm in a relationship, but we have no kids. That there is something about millennials where it just, it didn't happen. Well, but values change to accommodate reality, right? I yeah. mean, like, you know, I just think about, I, I was just ahead of this curve. I guess I got lucky for that. But you, if you're about 35, about your age, you basically, um, Got out of high school, 9-11 happens. We've been at war ever since you've been anything like an adult, right? And all the only politics that you've known is people screaming at each other, calling each other Nazis and so forth. And that's it. That's, that's our politics as far as since you've ever been paying attention to politics. That's what it's been. You just get out of college and like the year or two after you get out of college, the financial crisis hits. And things are just a waste for several years. You finally start to maybe get back on your feet in your mid-30s and you're starting to put something together. COVID hits. Like this is just an incredible amount of instability for any generation to handle. And, you know, the millennials are going to be the first generation in American history that has a lower standard of living than their parents do. Yep. And you cannot overstate, I think, how significant that is, right? Because it's not just that, like, oh, my parents had a house that was this big and I only get a house that's this big what people relate it to, like what their basic standard of what a life should look like is how things were when they were growing up. And so you have an entire generation of people who in the aggregate grew up a certain way and are starting to realize and understand that they are going to take a step back from where that was. And that's, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not some like huge mystery why we get Bernie Sanders at a time like this. There's a, uh, this viral video about pod housing where people, mm. these, these companies will buy like a, a decently large loft and then stack up like f like five little cube, like cubes and then five on top. And you crawl into this little, it's probably five feet wide, no, four feet wide, four feet high. And you crawl into your little mat on the floor with your TV and your art and that's your pod. Everyone shares the kitchen and bathrooms. And there's videos of these millennials being like, it's just so awesome. It's only $800 per month. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, no, That's for real. So much. <laughs> you want to live you want to live in some of these cities, man. You've look, it's only four a month with a roommate. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look at that. Well, hey, this, this is what you're going to get communism. Yeah. You're going to get little hippie houses, buildings where there's going to be like 50 millennials all living in it. And they're sharing their kids like. Like their kids are going to be just communal kids, I mean. I saw a tweet, and I need to verify this one, but I believe it was from the World Economic Forum, and it showed young people about our age living in a tiny house, and it said, if you own a big house, you're racist. You need to own a small house. You need to own nothing and be happy about it. And I was telling my dad about this when he came out a little while ago. I said, Dad, I feel a great sense of 
almost resentment, but very much a sense of missing something that we never had. Because I know now that the American dream that I grew up with is not something that I will ever see. I will never see my white picket fence. That's not something I, that I'm ever gonna have. Yeah, the I American think, dream was true. The American dream was based true? on imperialism and war. No, it I wasn't, think it wasn't a real thing. Oh. I think one of the issues is, I, I also think millennials are the first generation of mass debt college students. I don't think uh, Gen X, for the most part was inundated at the same way the millennials were. The boomers certainly weren't. weren't. So one of the issues is, is, I believe, when I grew up, every single adult was like, you have to go to college. And I would just be like, why? And they would be like, because otherwise you won't get a good job. And then I'm just like, I don't understand. Well, I've told this story before. I read an, an op-ed from an economist, I think he worked under Clinton, where he said that if you went to any investor and said, you give me $40,000 in an investment, and in four years, you will owe me $40,000 plus interest, and that's it. They would laugh in your face. That's the stupidest investment I've ever heard of. But this is what we're telling every 18-year-old to do, to take out a loan with interest that gets them no guarantees. They don't know why they're going to college. They don't know where they're going to work when they get out. And a bunch, of the, a bunch of these millennials went in for liberal arts, and now they're slammed with debt confused. But we had the boomer generation. I tell you, man, they were screaming in my ears. They would shut up about it. So now you have an entire generation saddled with impossible debt, just hating the system, all of the problems you mentioned with, the, with war, with the financial collapse, the security state. And they've just, I think they've just lost the ability to, to, to function in any meaningful way relative to the past generations. Well, I think he hit on a good point. It, it's something I really worry about, right? Which is maybe there are no economic policies that we're going to have or anything that are actually going to get things back to where they were in the 50s and 60s. You know, maybe all of that was a just it was a relic of the fact that the entire world got destroyed and deindustrialized in World War II, except for us. And they all needed American labor and American capital. And, you know, we're five percent of the world's population. We got 30 percent of the world's resources flowing into the imperial center. And maybe that was just never sustainable. And you just wonder, like, even if, you know, we're five percent of the world's population, if we only got 15 percent instead of 30 percent of the world's resources, we're still like probably at the top of the heap, I don't think we could handle, I, I think there would be a violent revolution if we had to take a half, a 50% cut in our standard of living in this country, you know? And so maybe it was never, it was never something sustainable. I think people just got to learn to go live in the middle of nowhere. And a lot of people who live in the middle of nowhere are like, no, you're going to ruin the middle of nowhere. Don't tell them to come here. Well, but that's the, the difficulty, right? Like I remember when the yellow vest protests were going on in France mm -hmm. and I read an article by one of the leaders of it. And the thing he said was, and this is true in France, it's true in the United States to a large degree, is that the places that you actually have to go to work are becoming increasingly concentrated in like a few urban centers. Those places are becoming impossible to actually live because they're so expensive because everybody has to go there. It's like you can, I mean, there's probably more, you know, jobs out in the middle of nowhere if you're willing to be an electrician or a plumber or something like that instead of, you know, uh, but, you know, we've spent just God knows how many hours and, and how many dollars of propaganda to convince people that that makes them a failure in their life if they end up doing that. So, you know, one of the one of the biggest challenges as we're trying to build this new studio is, you know, we're trying to find a local expert in folklore mythology, but we just can't find any. You know, if only there was someone who can come and read us the, the, the ancient words that could help us. I, how, I have you, no idea how to help you'll build our facility. If only they can do like a feminist analysis of the Epic of Gilgamesh. <laughs> you'll find that. Yeah. that. That would actually be a good bit we should do where it's like, you know, in order to get the uh, the new studio built, we had to bring in a feminist interpretive dancer. <laughs> like you see that parliament thing, oh, okay. like European parliament where they're just dancing and it's oh, like, yeah. oh, I think man. regarding what you said about standard of living, that was interesting that this would be the first generation to have a standard of living less than the generation before. And I wonder, maybe financially, I agree with you financially for sure. That's what it looks like. But my parents' generation got drafted into Vietnam, oh, sure. destroyed their standard of living. I mean, annihilated the entire generation. He, it, it ruined their lives. And World War I annihilated the entire generation. G we, give, give them a little more time with Russia. We'll see what yeah, happens. Yeah, so that's why I'm so <laughs> anti-war. If you think that even, even considering a war right now is any benefit, you got to understand what countries do with large un, uh, un, uneducated and un... Uh, what do you call it when they don't have a job? Un unemployed. unemployed masses. They, what they, countries do with those people, they send them to war to die so they don't have to feed them and take care of them. So you do not want to push for a war. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think I think you made a very interesting point about America sort of stepping in after the Second World War and becoming this economic powerhouse. And I hadn't considered that before. And I want to give it some thought. But another point I like to make when it comes to the change in the standard of living is the fact that the workforce really became oversaturated because we doubled the labor supply once we decided that rather than a, a sole breadwinner, rather than the father representing the family unit economically in, in working, we were going to have both parents work because that was somehow, you know, woman's liberation. We ended up in a position where your average worker now had half the negotiating power. Oh, yeah. And so I think that's been seriously detrimental to this country. But ultimately, whether you're talking about, you know, a, a crony capitalist system or a capitalist system which is not managed virtuously or a communist system, in the end, you have a, a really horrific situation where your average person does not have property and therefore no investment in the system. Yeah, this whole BlackRock let's, owning property thing's got to go. Let's just, uh, let's just uh, uh, start from step one. And this isn't a value statement or a moral statement. Women largely enter the workforce around starting in the 70s and the late 70s, right? That's when we, you know, so, so I mean, for our, our parents' generation, it was like they were young adults. Like all of a sudden women were getting jobs. You know, for me, I grew up, it was always the case. Mm. But once women are in the workforce, you now have both men and women focused on the breadwinning aspect of life and no f familial aspect of life. So who's going to raise the kids? Well, daycare becomes a question. They now say we need, you know, businesses to offer daycare for our kids or public schooling. Mm -hmm. The government has to replace the family. Yep. And that is not going to work out well for anybody. It's this slow creep where like uh, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, right, talked about this with technology, how uh, a car is invented. And it's like, wow, now I can get a car and I can drive wherever I want. Like I could only walk or ride my bike before. Now I can drive. I have the freedom of the road. Let a little bit of time go, go by. And now having a car is not an option. You have to have a car to survive in our society at all. Yep. And you're commuting 45 minutes to work every day, stuck in traffic, and you have no choice. And it's kind of similar here. Like, oh, wow, women can go out and get a career. They can go out and get jobs now. Well, give it a couple of years. And now women have to get jobs. Both parents have to work just to survive because wages have stagnated and costs have gone up. They, and it has I, a way of working like that. I never hear the left talk about that. They always show these graphs where it's like, I wonder what happened in 1979. And then yeah. I see this meme where it's like labor unions started losing power. And I'm like, it's true, but you double the workforce and your bargaining power gets cut in half overnight. And not just that, but you've got you've got somebody who's you know running a business and they say to the guy, so tell me about your family. And it's like, oh, my wife works here and you know we're planning this and this. And I need X amount of dollars. It's like, your wife's got a job. You don't need that much money. Mm. Like, you're, you, you co mm -hmm. the collective salary between you and your wife is going to be 75K. You're fine. Yeah, I think the expectation is that you're going to be a dual income household. And so right. you don't need to be paid a wage that would be sufficient for supporting a family. And just to clarify something I said earlier, I said that people who, who don't have property don't have a stake in the system. I misspoke. They don't have as much of a stake. There's still a stake in the system, but they are much easier to control. What, what is the phrase? Dink? Is that it? Is? Dual income, Dual no, income kids. no kids. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 think I, you're, I think you're right. Easier though. to bully. I mean, I think, I think there's some invest. Like, I because I, I don't want. I think property is very important, but I also I don't want to say like if somebody has no property, then like well, they're it, not doing things that could be selfless or beneficial. It's to the not system. just property though; it's stability. Yes. Right? Like you know, I, I've seen uh, every time I go into an airport, I see like a fast company magazine, one of those like new hip business magazines. And it always have like some kind of cover article they do. And it's one of those recurring articles that they do again and again in different, you know, slightly different ways. And it says like how for this generation, you know, the young generation, the young people coming up today are going to change careers six times throughout their lives. And that the skill of the future isn't going to be like mastering some skill. It's going to be mastering the art of learning so that you can go through these changes like smoothly. And it's like, well, OK, like. If you're some super high IQ person with like a good start, you know, in your early 20s and you kind of like knew what you were doing and you got off on a good start, good for you. But what happens when, you know, if you change, change careers six times throughout your life, that's six times maybe you have to move six times that your friends get changed. Eventually that just becomes, I mean, I went to like 35 different schools between kindergarten and 12th grade. And by third grade, I just learned like, don't make friends. It's a pointless exercise, right? And so people learn. Uh, you know, don't get too attached to the place you live. Don't get too yeah. sentimental about the people you meet there. Mm -hmm. And 
that, so I, I think there is a loss of investment, you know, and then what they, what they end up doing is as maybe as a replacement, a prosthetic for that is they displace that sort of social concern that they have onto some, you know, broad social yeah. issues on the federal level or something like that. I think that can absolutely happen. I think that can absolutely happen. And you made a, a point earlier about how we couldn't come in and just cut everyone's standard of living in half. And I was I was mentioning communism. And of course, I believe that, you know, communism is an unbelievably horrific, barbaric system. Uh, I mean, it, it's not just a matter of people not having property. They, I mean, they slaughter people. But at the same time, if a communist regime were to be instilled in the United States and they were to tell people, you know, you have to live in a pod now, it would be much more of a struggle than to just erode the economic independence of the American people over time to the point where they say a pod, that's a really great deal. Or van life. Mm, yeah. I remember when uh, that there was this woman on YouTube who was po she posted like two van life videos and gained like three million subs overnight because there was apparently some glitch in the algorithm where she hit all these key points. And so YouTube's algorithm just showed her videos to literally everyone. So she makes like two videos, gets three million subs. But I, it made me, made me think of a potential conspiracy that YouTube was intentionally promoting van life as a way of making millennials happy, being happy with owning nothing. For real, think about what happened. So when this van life trend was going around in like 2018, all these people are on YouTube and they're like, I live in a van. I can go wherever I want. I got no rent. I got a computer and my dog and we're going surfing. And then they post these videos where they're playing that song by, I think it's by Avicii. He said, one day you'll leave you. Or whatever that song, it's like on repeat. And they're all like running and like filming themselves. Life is so good living in a van down by the river. <laughs> and I just, I was like, I wonder if YouTube's promoting that because they want people to own nothing and be happy. And then all of a sudden we got that video from the World Economic Forum that said you will own nothing and you'll be happy. I will not live in the pod. I will not eat the bug. It's tough to tell because it's like calling it, you, what does YouTube want? It's monolithic. Corporations don't have wants, but certain people within the corporations may very well have that in mind. Hmm. I would think that most people involved hadn't thought about that or thought that far ahead. It almost seemed like the dream, the American dream is so prevalent that people had bought it at that point. What were you saying? Yeah, well, no, I think regardless, even if it's not the case that there's an algorithmic push to direct people towards this kind of content our generation I would say generations prior have really been slowly sold this idea that independence is the most important thing you can possibly have right so commitment and productivity are significantly less important than being able to do whatever you want whenever you want and it's true that if you are just living out of a comfortable van you're not tied down anywhere. You uh, don't have as high of expenses. It's much easier for you to travel. I'm not saying it's a preferable way to no, live, no, no, but no, it is the way to live that we have been sold. Maintaining over these time. vans is not easy. They can't drive. I mean, you get. But a, maintaining a house is really difficult. Well, yeah, and I no. would say maintaining a van is probably a lot less expensive. Um, but if you're if you're living in a van, I don't know if you're going to have the kind of job that's going to be a you know. Yeah, unless well, you're one of these van life is, YouTubers. Well, again, my whole point is there's a lifestyle, whether it's there's a lifestyle that's been sold to us, which is that independence is the most important thing. It is far more important, as I said, than productivity or commitment, building something in the long term. What matters is you can pick up and leave and do whatever you want, whenever you want. And so it's unsurprising that it's such a huge trend. Thanks for checking out this segment from the Timcast IRL podcast. But if you want to check out the full show live, Tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And if you want more special access content, head over to TimCast.com and become a member. Your membership helps sustain this company, keep our journalists employed, makes this show happen, and you will get access to exclusive members-only segments of the TimCast IRL podcast. And there's a massive library to check out. So again, go to TimCast.com or tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And we'll see you all there.